What's the first theme song that goes through your head as you wake up in the morning? No. Huh. That doesn't do it for me. It doesn't do it for you? No, it doesn't. Why, why did you I would allow get out of the to bed. get approved <laughs> as the no. theme song for A Time to Think? Because it's copyright free. That's why oh, I approve okay. it. We'd have to yeah. pay a dime for it, Josh. That's why. See, just like the goal of our podcast, we didn't seek a theme song that was necessarily good, just helpful. And you know what's really helpful? Free. Free, yeah. Welcome to A Time to Think, where we do spend time... <laughs> Thinking. thinking. And obviously not enough time thinking about our theme music. Or our introductions. We kind of yeah. just go, hey, we should probably do this before the staff meeting. Let's Correct. go. Correct. And then whatever happens, yeah. happens. In but fact, I, have... I wanted to lodge a Karen-level complaint call before recording this. And Josh said, you who are listening right now are more important mm-hmm. than your Karen-level complaint. So. But you can rest assured that the spirit of Karen is still, <laughs> <It's> still alive <laughs> and well in the heart of Chris Tillman. Oh. And so you, maybe if I ask a dumb question instead of you going, well, I'll answer that dumb question and just go, you're dumb. Or I'll, or I'll kick you. Kick no, you in the shins. you need to do something where the, the listeners, okay. the people. Well, if you were, say owl loud enough, they'll know. Oh, sure. A Time to Think is a podcast uh, devoted to thoughtful, careful engagement with issues in the culture and the church. I do not know why Chris is laughing. (laughs) Because as you start listing off the things we try to be, I realize that everything we just did for the past two minutes reflected none of that. Well, that's why we start with reminding people why we're here after the introduction. And and then it gets heavy. We get the thoughtlessness and the carelessness out, you know. Well, at least it's temporarily suspended. (laughs) We're just trying to endear ourselves. (laughs) To people, so we we're coming in in a series on discipleship. Eventually, what I where I want to get Chris is to tackle a, a list of, I think, little you could say lies we believe. To use the um, that's not Rosaria Butterfield's new book. There, you could say lies we believe. You could say maybe philosophical principles that just seem normal. But I eventually want to get to things in the cultural milieu, milieu ooh, in which we live, yeah. milieu. Things that, like you said, the milieu, the, the surrounding culture that we've just come to think are true. Uh, you might think of things like... Like the earth is round. Or my truth. <laughs> my truth is that the earth is round, Chris. Um, Both not true. Things like you're all you need, or guilt is bad, or obedience is legalistic, or the future is bleak, or worship in the church is more about what I get than what I mm-hmm. give. All these different things we just kind of come... Maybe we never sat down and we thought, this is what I believe, mm-hmm. but we've just been taught it. We've right. imbibed it. Uh, yep. We've been informally taught Discipled it. Discipled by our culture. Yeah. So we're going to get there in a second, but I, but I want to take a moment between the last episode where we talked broadly about what discipleship is, what the learning life of humans is, and then when we get to this particulars of these little individual beliefs. In the middle here, I want to talk uh, some, some about the uh, maybe the implements of how we learn or some different things that yeah. affect us that we, we may not think we're learning or being shaped, but we really are. Mm-hmm. Two things I have in mind, Chris, are uh, technology and music. Yeah. And so I want to talk about both of those. And then if you have anything else that you think are things that we might not think are shaping us, but really are, then we can talk about that as well. Yeah, for sure. Let's start with music. Chris, how does, how does music shape us um, maybe in ways that we are unaware of? Yeah, you know, I've thought about this a fair a fair amount, and um, partly because I'm a musician, partly because there's always um, a song in your soul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, going back to my first uh, my first days as a as a genuine Christian, um, one of the first things that I did was I went to my my parents' backyard and I burned a bunch of CDs that I had. Now, by burn, I don't like mean like conversion? burned off of LimeWire. I mean like burned, like burned them in a pit because I was like, this music is bad. This music is not good. Uh, this music included a lot of uh, grunge rock hits from the mid to late 90s that I had uh, collected when I was uh, a youngster. And so at the time, I recognized that the, the music I had had a profound um, influence potentially on me. Um, I've since come to have a, a different conviction. I, I do listen to secular music right now. and So what do you burn um, now in the backyard? Now? I, somebody actually, believe it or not, somebody lit a fire on my property and never told me. The police or the fire department came, put it out and everything. They never contacted us, letting us know that there was a fire on our property in the far end of our backyard. 
Fun fact. Uh, wow. Some, so somebody else burned something on my property, and they never told us about it. So really, really appreciated that. That was good. Um, but no, I, I, I took the, the music out there, did that. I listen to secular music now, and um, I, I would say the reason I can listen to secular music at this point is because I have come to a place of understanding that the music may not be inherently, I mean, there's inherently bad music. And I don't, I don't mean qualitative, I mean just inherently bad music, right? So if, if songs are encouraging you to participate in evil, sinful behaviors, then you shouldn't be um, discipled by that music, right? You should be like, oh, that's not a good idea. I'm going to go and do X, Y, Z. But at the same time, um, throughout my Christian life, um, there's also been this, this awareness that, Music does have uh, a significant place when it comes to how the soul reflects what's actually happening inside of it. And so, you know, Jesus said it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, it's what comes out. And so music is a funny thing because it's a reflection of what's happening inside of us. And so when you go to the Psalms, you're seeing this divine songbook that God has given to his people to, to reflect, like, here's my heart condition right now, here's my soul condition right now. And you can rest assured that as you pray through the Psalms, you're praying in a way that God is pleased to hear from you about the condition of your soul. But it also can influence you, mm -hmm. right? And so music is both a reflection of what's going on inside, but it can also, because music is such a powerful conduit for emotion, right? then that the, the musical content uh, can also have an impact on how you're processing your emotions. And so if you're listening to music, that might be encouraging you to, uh, you know, just go and ruin somebody's day, right? I mean, fill in the gap with whatever is going to ruin somebody's day. And you're having a particularly hard day, listening to that music might encourage you, disciple you in a direction to think, this is a proper way to deal with my frustration and angst right now. And so I'm going to go and do X, Y, or Z. So um, I think there's some initial reflections for me because, you know, my, my convictions on the matter have changed over the years. Uh, but it is important to be aware of the fact that music is a powerful conduit for emotion and a powerful conduit therefore for content to come through yeah i would even say maybe if you don't go do something to someone if if you're angry and music becomes the outlet for that anger mm -hmm. but that anger is not filtered through christian channels of your own heart and your own proclivities towards sin or mm -hmm. understanding that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of god or right. understanding that God in his perfect holiness has a day of vengeance and therefore our human anger does not need to be wielded against others in the way that we might want it to be because mm -hmm. God is just and will make all things right. Well, music, if, if I just think that trying to get anger out through this music, I am being discipled that expression of my anger is the right. appropriate means of action, yep. even if I never go light a fire in Chris's backyard. Right. And, and so was he, it you, Josh? It was Did not. You, okay. you yeah. think I would drive all the way to insert city here? I won't give your address away. <laughs> uh, just to light a fire in your backyard and not invite you to come out and warm up. Yeah. And, and so that, that's a small thing. Even if it doesn't lead me to some overt action that harms another person, if it teaches me that venting my frustration is the proper right. means, instead of going to Proverbs, a fool vents mm -hmm. his whole heart or a fool vents all that he's thinking, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, the Proverbs teach me is that, that venting what is inside of me is a foolish thing to do. Yeah. But if music is teaching me the opposite, it is discipling me that what I really need to do is just be angry right, right. now. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that that's, that's important. Um, I do think that the content of song is inescapable. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think that, I mean, I'm sure many of us have songs that we listened to at some point in our life and then we actually figured out what the lyrics were saying. Sure. Like, oh my goodness. Uh, especially you start to have kids, you start to get a little older. Like, I can't believe I listened to that. Mm -hmm. And there is a degree to which you can be oblivious to that in the moment, mm -hmm. but I don't think you can be totally oblivious to it. I sure. think you're still imbibing that content even if you don't fully know what it's actually communicating mm -hmm. later on. And it's, uh, that's actually the problem with music is that you can imbibe content without fully know what it, well, sure. knowing what it's saying. Yep. You know, if I just stand up on it as a preacher, and I speak clearly to you with nothing behind me, you should be able to fully know what I'm communicating. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon, I mean, if I got my friends up there to play piano, and at the end of my sermon, bah, mm -hmm. you just need to know, bah, and just I just had that, oh, that flooding, yep. nice chords. 
a lot of the heretical teaching that I've seen go around online has Comes piano music. behind yep. it. Absolutely. Um, and so you, we can't make the argument that, well, I didn't even really know what it was saying. That's actually the problem is that I can mm-hmm. imbibe content that I don't even know what it's saying fully, right. but it's still affecting me. It's still teaching me. And so those would be a couple of reflections on how, how music can train us and shape us. Um, and I do think, uh, I guess the other thing that I've thought as I think about music is just, I think music <laughs> trains us to think about what love is in a way that's super unhelpful. I want to know what love is. It's just don't hurt me. <laughs> um, baby, don't hurt me. So I was, I was at the gym and I was uh, listening to some songs over... I. My, Were you listening to Celine Dion again, Josh? Always. <laughs> so I was like trying to listen to a sermon, I think, and then my headphones weren't powerful enough to block out the gym music. And uh, in my head came these lyrics about love. Chris, every time we touch, <laughs> oh, gross. I get this feeling. Maybe I shouldn't have said Chris to start. Yeah, yeah don't lead off with that. <laughs> every time we touch, I get this feeling. Every time we kiss, I swear I could fly. My heart beats fast. I want this to last. And I thought, I thought to myself. You think that or you listen to that? I listen to that. Okay. And I thought to myself, isn't that kind of what people think romance is? When we kiss, Mm -hmm. I could fly. Yeah, that's mental illness actually. What (laughs) happens when we kiss and I don't feel like I could Mm -hmm. fly? I must be out of love now. You see that the subtlety of that song in most modern music teaches you that Love is accompanied by some wide, passionate array of emotions. Orchestral arrangements, yeah, exactly. And so when that's not there, well, then the love's not there. And if the love's not there, then the relationship would be over. Yeah. Rather than the biblical understanding of love where you have to cultivate it. It's Mm -hmm. more slow building. It's the type of thing where you look at someone you've been in a relationship over 25 years and you remember the types of... I'm still here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so that's another reflection I had on just these, these types of songs you can develop... You can see themes in how Mm -hmm. the culture sings about love or about expressing emotions or about individuality. Yep. That's a huge one right now. Baby, I was born this way, right? And so individuality, like if if we're constantly imbibing that content, we're going to naturally be shaped into people that think like the content that we are taking in. Mm -hmm. So how does what I'm saying play into what you're saying? All right? Yeah. Am I over-spiritualizing? Are you... Under spiritualizing, I'm sure it? I'm under spiritualizing at this point. I, I mean, I know there's a there's a pendulum, right? That that swings when it comes to issues of conviction, and the pendulum typically swings between, on the one hand, I'm abstaining completely; the other hand, of I'm indulging fully. And so, when it comes to issues of conviction, media is probably the the most significant one in our day and age as Christian people, because there's nothing. I mean. It's it's one of those things. How how much do you participate in the world, and in how much and in what capacity is participation, you know, perceived? Like, is, is, are you participating in certain activities because you are laughing at it? Are you participating in certain activities because you're watching it, right? Now, there are certain things that are clearly out of bounds. So watching uh, sexual activity on the screen is sinful, right? That's just, that's mm-hmm. not an acceptable uh, form of entertainment. So, you know, you, you get that out of the way right away, but then you get certain areas where you think, okay, uh, is it okay for me to watch a war film? You know, somebody shooting someone. That seems like a serious thing, right? Murder isn't exactly a fun fun situation to be involved with. Uh, am I being entertained by sin? Now, that's where I would say there are some convictional issues that people need to kind of sort through. But when it comes to music, the, the tricky thing with it is that themes in music, like you alluded to, um, can be problematic for us. But they may not be outright sinful. So if somebody's writing a love song, Okay, somebody, somebody puts together a love song and they're penning this and it, and it goes out there and you're listening to Ed Sheeran or whatever these, these people are doing these days. <laughs> whatever these people are doing. Well, I don't listen days. to Ed Sheeran. I listen to alt rock. Like, yeah, that's what yeah. I do. So, you know. And um, the Jonas Brothers who you, did you, was it you that mentioned the Jonas Brothers to me the other day? No. No, no. You, no, not who, me. The, you, One Direction is who you I don't even, the yeah. Day. Yeah, I don't even know who the Jonas Brothers, uh, what they sing, but, um. Anyways, you know, you, you, you get to those topics and they're not overtly sinful topics, right? Like a relationship between a guy and a girl is not overtly sinful. I mean, it's a good thing, right? God created man and woman, designed them to operate uh, complement- in complementary roles in marriage, okay? Mm-hmm. 
Now, do we start thinking in terms of, well, I can only listen to a, a love song that has to do with a uh, couple that is committed in covenant marriage before the Lord. Like, we what can go... What a rousing love right, song. Right, exactly. What a rousing love <laughs> song. We can go that end of the, the spectrum to that pendulum swing, or we can go the other pendulum swing, which is going over here and saying, it doesn't matter what I listen to, and I'm going to listen without discernment or without filter. And I think the place that I would say I'm good with, and I, I by no means do I want to prescribe this for anybody because issues of conviction are important, and mm-hmm. I, I would never want to diminish somebody's conviction if if they are if they tend to feel more uh, pricked in their conscience to avoid certain things, then I would never want to encourage somebody to go away from that, right? Because there's a reason their conscience feels that way, and whether it's overtly sinful or not, we're called to honor a brother or sister who may have an issue of conviction that shows a particular area of weakness. And that weakness is not spoken in, in, a, in a derogatory manner. It's just to say, you know, some people, you know, like some people who who have a problem drinking alcohol. And so if you're around that brother or sister, you drink alcohol, they have a problem with it. You abstain from it for the sake of that brother or sister. And you don't make fun right. of them or anything like that. So all I'd say, I, I don't want to diminish the convictions of other people. But at the same time, I would say the place that I, I would feel comfortable is to say... Music I listen to, and just to be open with this, like when I'm when I'm lifting, I listen to angry music, right? I listen to rock, like I, yeah. I listen. That's just what I listen to, uh, and it is in large part due to the fact that I feel a whole I lot stronger. To Gregorian chant, Gregorian chant, because I'm more holy than you. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is, Gregorian chant may be completely unbiblical. Um, ah, listen dang to it. the content, Josh. Chris got me again. The content. But um, I'm gonna got you one day. Okay, I've cut you off enough. <laughs> that's so, fine. No, so, so I you're mean, listening to hard rock when yeah, you're I mean, working out. Playlist I have. I mean, there's there's Andy Minio, who's yep. a genuine Christian guy who's writing music that is you know driving good music with good theology. The other end of the spectrum, I've got you know Guns N' Roses. Okay, mm-hmm. so Axl Rose definitely not encouraging me to live a, a godly lifestyle. Doesn't mean that by listening to music that is penned by somebody like that, it is leading me astray. No, but what it does mean is that you you need to be willing, and this is where I've kind of settled at this stage of my Christian life, you need to be willing to exercise a filtration device in your mind so that you're, you're like, okay, I know what's being spoken. So it's it's different than just letting it come through your head and be like, oh, I'm not being impacted by it. And say, I can be impacted by this. But it's coming through my head, and it's and I, I've got a filtration device that says, this, just like if you're watching a war movie, this is not real. right? So you're looking at a war film, and you're saying, this person did not actually die on the screen. I'm, I know what I'm seeing right now is a representation of death, and I don't need to take this seriously as though this is actually happening. I need to be willing to filter it through the lens of, okay, I'm processing this as this is an, an act that's been played. Okay? Just like you're watching Shakespeare, <laughs> like you're watching a play by Shakespeare, you have somebody dies. Does, does the actor die? No, they don't. So when 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 you're dealing with music, you have to use a filtration device and just think, okay, am I am I am I thinking properly about life after or during the listening of the song? And if you find that somehow you are being impacted in a way that the words that you should be aware of are coming through and it's like, I feel myself being more angry. You know, like I listen to quote angry music while I lift weights. Do I want to leave the other side of that as an angry person? The answer is no, I don't. Um, And so it, it really comes down to how are you actually receiving those words? And I think this is where we're, our discussion about discipleship is very critical because we're, we're getting influenced by all kinds of things all the time. You know, if you work in a secular workplace, you're hearing messages. I mean, right now, there are so many people, <clears throat> excuse me, who live in an environment where they are being told, you got to put your pronouns in. You have to do DEI stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to talk to your transgender coworker and call them by the name that's not theirs and the gender that isn't theirs. You know, you're being influenced. You're being told to do these yeah. things. So as a Christian, how do you exercise proper filtration of these different things that are being impressed upon you. And I think the wise Christian is the one who knows his or her limits and who knows where they need to say no on something that 
may not be overtly sinful, but that has the capacity to direct them in a way that is unhealthy spiritually, ultimately. Do you think the average Christian actually does know their limits? Or do you think that the idea of the wise Christian knowing their own limits tends more towards a Christian liberty, I'm fine, I can do mm-hmm. this, even to the excuse of behavior that maybe is past your life? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think the latter is definitely where it goes. But I don't think, to, to be generous, I guess, I don't think that, that people, and you know, present company notwithstanding, who are listening to this podcast right now, who are taking time to think, I don't think that most Christian people operate in those those terms. So I, I don't think that they either they do either one or the other. I think most Christian people just do what they do without thinking. And that's why it's important for us to consider how it is that we are being impacted. And so that means that we determine what are our limits. You know, I mean, I, I don't drink alcohol at all. Um, I'm one of like one people in the world basically that doesn't do that. Uh, I mean, that's well, one joking, person in Wisconsin. In one person, yeah, exactly. Um, but from what I understand um, from people, you know, brothers that I know who drink alcohol, they know what their limits are, hmm. right? Okay. And so they'll say, I, I can go to this spot in terms of I can have this many beers or I can have this particular mixed drink or whatever, and I know that I, I will not cross boundaries. Yeah. And I think that every Christian should be encouraged to consider how certain things that they may be involved with um, approximate that type of an experience. So, Yeah, I, I would uh, agree that you use the word filtration, thinking, these are active words. And one of the main issues with uh, particularly visual entertainment uh, and entertainment as a whole is uh, it's not in the it's not in the thinking realm in our minds so we're not we don't go to see a new marvel movie so we can think mm-hmm. it's actually we try to do the opposite we we go to the entertaining thing so we don't have to think mm-hmm. and therein lies the danger if we're listening to music so we don't have to think if we're going to watch a movie so we don't have to think if we're watching tv so we don't have to think but right. all the while content is coming at us that yeah. can change us exactly. we're in a dangerous position yep. and so we have to turn on our brains particularly in an increasingly secular culture and i think that's where a guy like me i start to go i don't really want to think when i'm trying not to think so i'm either going to find one show where i can just watch it and not feel bad at all not have to think at all because i've already run through it once right or i'm just not gonna watch anything because i i'm trying to go not think because <laughs> i have a, a a job that is called knowledge work by some sure. classes it's a reading job it's a thinking job it's a counseling yeah. job it's a writing communicating job it's a plumbing job <laughs> <laughs> and i so if i want to not think i have to say Best place to not think is probably not on the television because I need to think if I'm there. And mm. so that's that that in line for a guy like me, I go, I don't know if it's worth it mm-hmm. for me to use my relaxation time to have to think mm-hmm. about what the content sure. that I'm intaking is and what it's yeah. doing to me. Um, and so with regards to music, um, I think there's different spheres. So you think about working out, you go, all right. If I'm working out, my mind is probably primarily engaged on the weights that I'm lifting, right? Mm-hmm. And therefore, the music I'm listening to... And big to, gains, max gains. Max actually. gains, yeah. yeah. And the tank top I'm wearing. And <laughs> I, would, I would say that with working out, my mind is probably sufficiently engaged in li- the lifting of weights. And therefore, um, I'm probably mostly taking in the beat of the music rather than the Yeah, I'm the not content. meditating on Axl yeah. Rose's words. Right? But if I'm in the car... I hmm. bet I'm probably listening to those lyrics more, hmm. uh, you know, and, and I just, I think we have to take seriously how words change our minds about things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that once again goes for me, like if I got to think about how these words would change my mind, I'd rather just listen to a Christian artist. There's hmm. a lot of good Christian music out there. Um, that's how I've handled it personally. And hmm. uh, now I also am a weirdo who can listen to Gregorian chant. people talk slowly or listen to like this is going to sound really self-righteous. I can listen to like scripture audio Bible while I work out because I don't need the pumping up. Mm-hmm. So I'm just trying to think of what's, what would other people maybe say is boring while they're working out. Yeah. I could listen to a dry podcast or a sermon or something like that. Um, so I don't necessarily usually need – that's actually how I heard the love lyrics the other day. So I listened to a sermon. I didn't have anything to block out the um, – What kind of sermon were you listening to, Josh? Were you encouraged to see love is 
No, I heard the the lyrics from the gym over my oh, sermon. Oh, see, problem. I thought you were you were meditating on these lyrics about love provoking you. No, to fly no, no, like no. A bird. That was the YMCA's music. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I I I do think we have to take seriously the the lyrical content of the music because, as you said earlier, it has a powerful emotive effect. Um, there's a reason that that God has made us to sing. Singing is. Uh, is incredibly powerful. Uh, it engages as we bring words in through our heads and out through our mouths and we sing them and we sing them loudly and we become, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we allow the force of our emotions behind them. Yeah. It does change us uh, and shape us. It's, it's one of the reasons why I take very seriously and you take very seriously the songs we sing at church. Yep. Um, because we do believe that music has a powerful effect on yep. people. And so we want people to sing true things and mm -hmm. rich things. Um, so that's that's probably longer than I expected to take on music, but it's mm. it's just a good example of how we have to think about yeah. how the things that we probably don't think are teaching us are actually teaching us. Um, the second thing that I I have been studying recently, Chris, is how technology shapes us. Digital liturgies. Digital yeah. liturgies. So the idea of liturgy, we talk about this in the church. The idea of liturgy is it. It shapes you to expect a type of thing yeah. and to act in a certain way. So if you come to Downtown Mission Church, Wausau, you expect to hear a greeting and then a scripture and then a prayer mm -hmm. and then one song or two and then a fighter verse and then a third song and mm -hmm. then a prayer. And then it, you might not know that we have a liturgy, sure. but you, you know that you don't ever show up and I'm like, here's the sermon. <laughs> Right? Wait, what happened to the music? Yeah. Um, <laughs> or you don't show up and I say, praying for 30 minutes to start this. You know that mm -hmm. there's a structure and yep. it, it shapes you to expect a certain type of thing. Right. And so the idea of liturgies is that it can shape us into a certain type of person. And in this mm -hmm. book, Digital Liturgies, that I want to go through with our church is to say, it's not just about the content that is on your phone. Sure. It's about the phone itself. Yeah. Um, and so just, just having a phone in my pocket right now makes me the type of person where I could be texting my wife while I'm talking to you yeah. and be only half engaged with you. Mm -hmm. um, I could be on Twitter while I'm talking to you. I mm -hmm. could uh, wish I was elsewhere while I'm talking to you because with, with just my hand into my yeah. pocket, I can be elsewhere. And so, Chris, I want to take a little time to talk about how uh, technology, how per particularly the smartphone yeah. shapes us into a different type of person. We learn how to be a different type of human because of what we have. Yeah. So, I mean, this is definitely something that I observe with children. Um, our family has policies regarding technology, and we, <clears throat> we do not allow Internet access unfettered in our home. Uh, we have our, our children, um, and... Thankfully, they don't hate us for it. So you know, praise the Lord that the, that That's a win. the, the kids, <laughs> the kids in our home do uh, do understand why we have some of the policies we do. But um, you know, we've we've made it clear that if our children want to have a, uh, a smartphone, they'll get one when they're eighteen, and they will purchase it themselves. It's partly because I'm cheap, but also because they need to know how to engage with the world before the world engages them. You know, and yeah. and that's you know during their childhood. You know, they, they need to develop the skills and understanding for how to function as adults who love Jesus uh, rather than having the world shape them, you know, through this, this very strange medium that exists of, of digital devices. So, you know, in our home, we have that, that policy. We have a policy regarding Internet access and so forth. But what I see when I, when I, when I look at um, children who are raised without boundaries, digital boundaries, um, you know, I, I'm going to run a risk here and it, it might be offensive. So I apologize for anybody who may find, find this offensive, but I do think it, it needs to be stated in this conversation. I think one of the reasons there's been a dramatic rise in what we call, uh, autism, uh, in terms of the autistic disorders that people have is that, um, what might be confused for, um, you know, somebody who has a, a genuine developmental disability like autism or Asperger's uh, are simply children who are so poorly adjusted because they haven't learned how to emotionally process the world because their entire life has been mediated through a device that has given them everything they want whenever they want it. Mm. And so, you know, I have a dear friend whom I love who, who has autism and, 
his disability is a real and significant thing. And yet I think about so many children that, that I've just in, you know, encountered in public or I've seen make displays that are just, you know, not a result of a, of, of a disability, of a learning disability, but simply seeing people throw temper tantrums because, you know, at age five, they can't have this iPad in front of them and, and just throwing a fit saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. And they won't be pacified until they get that. And so children develop these ways of processing the world that are so strongly antisocial that it becomes confused with a legitimate, like congenital disability, uh, where somebody who has a, a you know a, a disability like autism, it, it becomes confused for that because we're processing reality in a way that individuals who otherwise could be shaped by the normal rhythms of human experience and interactions are given a, a, a pseudo disability. They're they're put in a position to not know how to relate to other people, and so then show up as those who don't know how to, even though they're capable, because they've been taught that the world is accessible through this medium and that they can simply expect, you know, you, you just think, what is the, the, the means of gratification for a digital device? It's if you tap this, you know, inside you have a desire. And this desire is going to be met if you tap the screen X number of times to, to key in this particular word or play this game. And then you don't get it. And what happens? You become angry. Mm -hmm. And so you just keep manipulating, manipulating, manipulating until you finally get the result you're looking for. And this is so bizarre and foreign to anything that we've ever experienced in human history that we have created an entire generation of narcissists where children are being discipled in narcissism. And for us as adults, I mean, we function similarly. We just haven't been raised in it yet, right? But now we've got a generation who are being raised to be digital narcissists and it's frightening because it's completely robbing human beings of the ability to interact with each other. Yeah, I think you you could say something in a similar vein with things like attention deficit or right. anxiety or depression. Yep. You have uh, a legitimate category of um, significant, helpful to have treatment for right. ADHD, anxiety, depression. And then you have uh, an inability to have a focused conversation right. because I haven't gone... Mm -hmm. Two minutes today without touching my phone. Yep, that's not a that's a that's a training. That's a liturgy that right. has made me into a type of person. And and I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not above this. And that's why. Exactly. So there's a thing that's like okay, this could be really really potent for kids. But I also know that I supposedly have a fully formed brain by the age of thirty. <laughs> sure. Um, I haven't experienced the fully formed brain yet. Uh, I still make dumb decisions all the time. But I know we got off our last podcast. And then I went to my phone. I immediately felt a, a rush heart rate over the hmm. six email notifications I had. From Nigerian oil princes, in fact. Yes, yeah. they want to partner with our ministry. <laughs> um, turns out none of them were pressing issues. Okay, my, my heart rate goes yeah. down momentarily. I go out. I'm going to have about a minute and a half to move my car before I get in another car with a human being named mm -hmm. Chris. Mm -hmm. And my first thought is I should go to a podcast. For the minute and yep. a half yep. that I have. And so as even as a grown man, I know the temptations of yep. I, have to f I have to fill every moment with things and also, oh my gosh, if this thing demands something of me, yep. then I'm anxious. Yep. Um, and then the anger piece that you talked about is profound. Like it's something as simple as trying to refresh a Twitter feed and I mm. don't get the 35 new tweets option. And I'm like, come on. Right. I'm here, yep. and that that's actually really profound. That I would I do get frustrated in that yep. moment, and and so all of this shapes us into the type of person that uh, is angry when we don't get what we want, is unable to sustain attention, yep. and that's an issue. That's a real issue when it comes to yep. uh, a huge part of the Christian life is prayer, mm. reading or meditating on God's yep. word, um, and significant time spent with the body. And if none of us can maintain attention on mm -hmm. a person or on a text, then yeah. we're going to really be robbed of the what what's Protestants have called the means of grace. Yep. Um, and, and if we continue to spend more time on checking the notifications, constantly wondering if we're up to date, we, we become the type of people whose anxiety can only be quelled 
mm-hmm. if we don't have notifications. Not yeah. the type of people who, uh, who know how to take our anxieties to yes. the Lord in prayer exactly. and offer them up to him. And so our phones train us into being the type of people that um, are angry when we don't get what we want, anxious if we have too much demanded of us, uh, sorrowful if we see others have things mm-hmm. that we don't want, and unable to hold our attention. Yeah. And yeah. The, that, that's not even to do with what the content is. Right. The content could be Quasi Cupcakes, if you know the TV show reference, or Candy Crush, if you've actually played that Candy one, Crush. or it could be something vile. Right. But either way, the, the, it's not, the, not even talking about the content. Yeah. We're talking about the medium of the content. Yeah, and I, you know, it's interesting, Josh, as, as we think about, you know, I, I don't want to single out the autism issue, and I appreciate you bringing up the other, I, I guess we would say mental health issues that people deal with or neurological. I mean, I have epilepsy, so I'm not a stranger to dealing with a, a neurological condition. But man, I think, you know, I've been off of Facebook for a handful of years now, um, and it was done in large part because of this type of situation. I'm like, you know what, I'm putting way too much stock in what these people think about me. I should care about the people who are actually around me instead of the, you know, 600 people that I've not seen in 15 years. You know, I, I should care more about the people who are right here with me right now. And, and so, you know, I think, though, about that time, and I'm like, you know what, what, what about that feeling when you put something out on Facebook. And like you said, the content could vary wildly. I mean, I could put a quote out on Facebook from, from Jonathan Edwards, and I'm expecting, you know what? People in church are going to love this. I'm going to put this out there. And then and you check back later in six hours. and it's like you, Two likes. Yeah, two likes, exactly. And you're like, huh. Oh, man, I guess it wasn't that good. And maybe you'll delete it. You know, maybe Because it's like you just feel this sense of defeat. You feel depression. You feel as though somehow you've not done something that is meaningful or helpful or anything. And instead of seeing, well, two people benefited from something you just spent time to do, you've made it more about, well, I expected more. I expected more from, from these people. And so you be, begin to develop resentment against people who aren't responding certain ways. And, and all of this to say, like, we've taken conditions that are serious, significant medical conditions and then we've created this, this tier of pseudo-quasi conditions that are there in some instances, in many instances, I would say, not necessarily because there's an actual medical, neurological problem, something like that, but simply because we have adopted a way of viewing the world that is unnatural and unhealthy, regardless of the content. And I think that's the important point to it's make like here. You, you are more sluggish if you eat poor food for a couple of days. Right. And... You could fix that sluggishness and maybe even that slight depressive mentality yep. with a healthy diet for three days. Yep. Now that's you can't fix all depression with that. Exactly. But you, a lot of our uh, slow uh, like feeling mm-hmm. can oftentimes be due to our diet. It's the yep. same thing with our phones. You yep. can start to track how much time have I spent in this. I've said this before. I feel like television and devices are this weird mix of depressant and stimulant. Sure. A lot of drugs are either stimulant or depressant. They either get you really going or they slow you down. Yep. And it feels like these digital medias are like both. Mm-hmm. I'm somehow so gripped because of the flashing lights and I can slowly feel that after one episode I'm just a zombie. Yeah. You know, and I only turn it off when it's time to go to bed. Fall over. <laughs> right. And um and so it just Part of Samuel James' book, this is probably the most spicy part of it, but I thought really, really helpful. He had a chapter called The Internet is Pornography Shaped. Hmm. So he said the internet is shaped like pornography. And he said, Explain. Not, this is where he's differing between content and form. Yeah. He said not everything, obviously, on the internet is pornography. Not everything sure. is illicit sexual material. Mm-hmm. But he said that, that the internet as a whole trains us to be the type of people that consume that type of content. Hmm. Meaning... He said, pornography isolates you. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is novel in nature. I can get whatever I want new Mm. when I want it. Um, And it is consumptive in nature. I I am objectifying. I am making an object. I'm consuming, which is only for me. It's not for the good of others. Mm. And he says that the internet as a whole is shaped like that. Mm. Uh, You know, the difference between having a family computer in one room where maybe you brought people together to watch a thing. Yeah. Um, or that the computer was in a public place, now the computer is in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So I can be with the computer in the bathroom when I go to use the bathroom. I can be in with my 
my bedroom, we could have four mm-hmm. people in four different bedrooms with four different computers. Yeah. And so it's isolating. Um, and mm. it's even, if I'm on Twitter and my wife's on Instagram in the same room, we are not together. Right. We are in different worlds. It isolates us yep. from one another. So that's one. It's consumptive. Mm-hmm. It's just get more. Mm-hmm. Get more. So now I'm the type of person who's both isolated and consumptive. Mm-hmm. And we do that with our diets. Get more. Eat yep. more. Get more. And so it, it turns me into that type of person. Um, and the third is novelty. We are just concerned with a new thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want new. We want refresh. We want more. Mm. We get to that point where we don't even care what we're reading. We just want it to be new. Yeah. And so the internet as a whole turns us into the type of person that's only concerned with mm. what we can get by ourselves, for ourselves, that's new mm. to ourselves. And and you can see how that type of mentality that shapes a person is going to really be destructive for actual legitimate relational engagement with yep. other human beings. Yeah. Because what happens when Chris is not new? Mm-hmm. What happens when Chris gets in the way of me wanting what I want? Which happens <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Um, um, and so I thought that was so helpful. I said, that, okay, if I'm spending a lot of time on a smartphone or on the internet, um, now some, some internet stuff is unavoidable, like if you have work that is yeah. to do online. But if I then work online and spend my free time online, mm-hmm. how is that impacting me? How mm-hmm. is that changing me? Yeah. Um, and one, one more thing I think that I've processed as far as how technology shapes me is it teaches me that um, I am primarily an information intaker, mm. not primarily a meditator. I mentioned this a little mm. bit on the last podcast, but um, it is is much easier for me to read five articles in a row than to read one and think about it for 10 minutes. Mm. And so then my... The substance of what I'm reading is going to be less and less and less, Mm -hmm. or my engagement with what I'm reading is going to be more and more and more shallow because I'm really just reading to read and to get through it. It's much harder for me to read two pages of a book, catch a line that I think is impactful, step back and think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I mentioned in the last podcast, the word that the scriptures use for how we are to approach and utilize God's word is meditation. Yeah. We We are to chew. We are to turn over the diamond as if you will. We are to hold the rock in our hand and feel all sides of the smooth stone. And it's the same rock, but this side is different. And we feel the rounded edges and we, Mm -hmm. we turn over the verse in our mind and we chew on it. And then we take it to the Lord and Mm -hmm. to, to where I think some of the Puritans argued that we hadn't actually read God's word. If we had not read, meditated, and then prayed Mm -hmm. that didn't even count because (laughs) it is a Puritan. Well, there's there's some validity to that though. But if I have not read it, processed it, and then prayed it unto the Lord. Mm-hmm. I haven't actually read it. Yeah. Well, you can imagine how that is the the antithesis of how I approach most articles online. Mm-hmm. So then, if I'm trained into the type of person that bear, that skims and skims, get just gets more information, more information. Okay, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know a lot of bit about anything. Mm-hmm. Well, then what happens when I come to God's word? Yeah, I think this. You know, for for just you know a little bit of illustration here, so people understand, especially if you're if you're in our churches. You understand how we function. I mean, I've never really put it together until, you know, kind of now thinking about it. But the way that we structure corporate worship on Sundays, I'm not even, I'm talking more content right now than I'm about overall structure. But um, I know, you know, if, if our design is to meditate on the Word of God, you know, songs are selected intentionally. Mm-hmm. Right, and so uh, other things that we do on Sunday morning are done intentionally because we see scriptures at the center uh, and, and so the passage that we're going to be expositing for that week is going to inform our song selection. It's going to inform this because we want people to meditate and reflect, genuinely reflect. And as we take as much time as we do to preach that that's on purpose, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a reformation tradition as it were, because they wanted to recover the centrality of scripture for corporate worship is that discipleship tool that, that mm-hmm. transforms us by renewing our minds. So we're just going to kind of center. That's going to be at the center, and then we're going to everything else can be centered around that. So if we're going to be preaching, you know, yesterday, um, or it'll be what eight days ago, nine days, whatever, when this is uh, put out there, preaching the first part of Revelation 13 and talking about counterfeit worship and the beast demanding worship uh, and everybody looking as a you know, counterfeit Christ, basically that kind of a thing. Yeah. And you know the the first the first song after the sermon yesterday um, that I chose was Wonderful Merciful Savior. And in, I did that intentionally. It was it was suggested, thankfully, uh, without even knowing the content by one of the worship team members. So uh, thank you, Chad, for that. Yeah. But um, 
you know, the, the chorus for that is, uh, you are the one that we praise, you are the one we adore. And I'm thinking, that, that works. Yeah. Because what we just thought about is that there is the beast out of the sea who is demanding worship, saying, worship me, worship me. It's like, no, the response is, Jesus, you know, <laughs> to you, triune God, yeah. we worship and we praise you. We did something similar in Wausau with the same passage. And in that passage, the... The, the earth dwellers cry out, who is like you? Yeah. And the song we sang after one was only a holy God. Yeah. And so the song after was designed rhetorically to be just like that question. Mm-hmm. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Yep. Who else could make every knee bow down? Not the beast. And the answer is exactly. Yeah. And so you're right that, that the, the flow of our service is to meditate. Mm-hmm. And um, you think about, if you don't touch your phone from... In Wausau, 9.37 until 10.55. Is that the longest non-sleeping time of your mm. week that you don't touch your phone? Mm. It might be mine. Sure. And, and that's significant. One, because we should do that more often. One of, the, one of the ways we can counter this is by setting aside hour or hours a day where we don't touch our phone. Yep. Which, is, which if you try it, is incredibly hard. I leave my phone in the car. I mean, my phone's in the car right now. No. Praise, good for you, man, because I would be sitting there going, Who's, who is texting me? I've got my watch on. I probably could get notifications. Sure. Um, and so one of the things we can do is say, okay, we actually need to be away from those things to meditate better. Um, I experienced this morning something that I think this is a real world example of why, what maybe technology has trained us into and how we counter it. I woke up anxious. Um, I woke up anxious about just a relational thing. And I tried to read and I couldn't get my mind off it. So mm. I would like read one sentence and I'd forget what I read because I was thinking about this other thing. Sure. And I prayed a little bit and I, I was just super scattered. Um, and I, I wanted to do something like get on my phone because I thought that would be an mm-hmm. easier fix. Um, but in the Lord's grace reminded me just to actually put the book down, pray for more than a shotgun 30 second mm-hmm. help me prayer, but like a three minute prayer. Mm. Please help me. This is what I'm struggling with. I'm not mm. trusting you. I need you to fix it. Mm-hmm. I'm praying, and I pick the book back up, and over the next 10 minutes, I can slowly feel that relational anxiety subside to the point mm. where after about 20 minutes, I'm finally reading the book. Yeah. So the point there is it took me 20 minutes to finally read the book. Yep. But once I had done that work to kind of almost undo the training of right. I could text that person, I could reread the message, I could do this, I could do that, I could distract myself. I had to untrain that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a a real sweet peace that came. You should be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Josh. I'm trying. I'm trying, Chris. (laughs) Uh, So the hopeful message there, guys, is um, it takes that for a lot of us. And if we're going to counter the culture of stimulation and engagement, there are going to be plenty of moments in our life where we actually have to fight through 15 minutes of really frustrating, I can't focus in order Mm -hmm. to get to that sweet peace of focused meditation, sustained attention. And yeah, and maybe even relationally, Chris, there are going to be times where the first 20 minutes we're at someone's house for dinner, we're going to, we're going to have that Awkward twitch. Awkward small talk or, yeah. And twitch towards our phones. Mm-hmm. It'd be easier to go in the other room. I'd rather do this. Yep. If I just pulled out my phone, but then the other person pulls out their phone now, everyone's on. Uh-huh. And we got to fight it and fight it and fight it. And then I think we realized 45 minutes in, oh, this is nice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's a lot about how music and technology shape us maybe in ways that we didn't expect. I'm hoping to do a lot more engagement with digital liturgies in the coming months because I think it's just really helpful to unearth hmm. what technology does. And also the author does a, a great job of giving gospel hope and how the gospel hmm. is richer, fuller, better than what our technology promises. As far as on a time to think, the next few episodes we're going to do uh, some of these, I guess you could say formal and informal things that surround us in that cultural milieu, things mm-hmm. we might be led to believe, why they come up, why we believe them, how we counter them. Yeah. That's going to be the next six to eight weeks of a time to think. As for now, Chris, thanks for being my thinking partner. Yeah, likewise. We're like Thunder Buddies. And thank you all for being our thinking partners. <laughs> and thanks for listening to NPR. That was a, ti- <laughs> that was a time to thoughts. think. <laughs>